Margaret Brooker is alive today because of a remarkable advance in medicine. She was one of the first babies in Britain to have her blood completely changed as a result of the National Blood Transfusion Service, which is now itself coming of age. Today she's a dental nurse and as fit as any girl. Every day, this sort of thing is happening up and down the country, the setting up of a blood donor session. Britain was the first country in the world to start a donor service, and today it calls on one and a quarter million people who twice a year voluntarily give some of their blood just to help others. Two hundred and fifty people were called to this session at Ilford, Essex. The regional organiser responsible for running all the sessions in this area makes regular visits to them. All kinds of people from 18 to 65 give their blood. Pauline Storey, for instance, is a laboratory secretary. Charles Lay is a press photographer, though his small son has only come along for the ride. George de Silva from Portugal is a sweet maker in a nearby factory. Ronald Brooks is a warehouseman. Daisy Edwards, a nurse, is an interested onlooker. Mrs. Caroline Gorman wears the gold medal, awarded for giving 50 or more pints. And since she's now reached the age limit, it's her last visit. It's a first visit for Mrs. Angela Peabody. She has a test to determine her blood group. There are four main groups, O, A, B, and AB, and various other subdivisions, some of which are very rare. The amount of blood in your body depends on your weight. It's roughly one pint for each stone. It takes five minutes to give a donation, and then there's a rest of 15 minutes, followed by a hot or cold drink and a biscuit. Mrs. Gladys Head, one of the Red Cross helpers, has also given her blood 42 times. The British Red Cross and other voluntary organisations help at many of the sessions. When the bottles are full, they're put into a refrigerated van and taken to the area's regional transfusion centre. This one at Brentwood, Essex, which is one of 19 in Britain, serves an area with nearly three and three quarter million people in it and has six mobile collecting teams then into a refrigerated room to await testing in the laboratories. Here, however many donations may have been given, a sample of each is tested twice to be sure that the blood group is correct and to check for impurities. In the centre's main office, if it's a new donor, the details are filled up on a coloured card which indicates the group. Every time he or she gives blood, a new certificate is added to each giver's record book. And it's from here, too, that all the 100,000 people enrolled in this area are called up twice a year. In each centre, there's a special laboratory to test the blood of expectant mothers who may have babies suffering from a serious form of jaundice. Like Mrs. Carmel Smart, awaiting her fourth child, whom the doctors expected would need at least one blood change. All through her pregnancy, Samples of Mrs. Smart's blood were carefully checked, and at the hospital, bottles of any group the baby might need were waiting. When Mark Anthony Smart was born, he weighed less than five pounds, and he needed an immediate blood change. A few days later, Mark Anthony was out of the incubator and looked as if he was getting ready to follow his famous namesake to the forum. He needed only one blood change. Little Peter Christofferson was one of the first babies to have two transfusions before he was born, and five more afterwards. His older brother Tom had one change after birth. Some sick people don't need complete transfusions, but only certain components added to their own blood. In this research laboratory, cells quick frozen in very low temperature liquid nitrogen 
can be stored indefinitely in a refrigerator at minus 197 degrees centigrade and when removed from it become liquid again in a few seconds. A very small amount of blood is used for research. Here for instance Brentwood's director works on blood clotting tests which may help to prevent thrombosis. Apart from this all of it goes out to hospital blood banks up and down the country once or twice a week or whenever it is urgently needed. When a rare group is wanted in an emergency, the hospital may have to call urgently to a centre for help, and this may mean looking through hundreds of bottles to find a supply of the exact blood needed. While in Britain all blood is given and received free of charge, in some parts of America and Europe, blood is bought and sold. Until he was 12, Ian Adamson was a semi-invalid with a hole in his heart. When he was operated on, the blood used in the heart-lung machine came from people he'd never met and who had never heard of him. He might even have had an emergency transfusion from a chap like Bill Bowler of the Greater London Red Cross Blood Transfusion Service, which was started, as was the whole idea of voluntary giving, by Percy Lane Oliver, a Red Cross worker in 1921. The donors in this service, like other special regional volunteers, will leave whatever they are doing to answer calls. In one of the laboratories at the Lister Institute at Elstree, day-to-day -day work, as well as research, is carried on. Here, plasma, the fluid in which the blood cells are suspended, is prepared for use. Plasma is valuable because it can be stored easily and used for any group until the right blood can be obtained. In this room, with a temperature of minus 25 degrees centigrade, the liquid is put onto spindles, turning at a thousand revolutions a minute for two and a half hours to freeze it. Next, the bottles are placed in racks and put in large drums. And after four days, the plasma becomes a dry powder. Then it is ready to be sent to hospitals, where it can be turned back to liquid very quickly when wanted, often in accident cases. A year ago, Police Sergeant Ken Irvin, himself a blood donor, was knifed through the heart by a suspect he was chasing up this alley in Moss Side, Manchester. But he got his man, and was later awarded the George Medal for his bravery. Twelve pints of blood and plasma helped the doctors to save him, and enable him to live a normal life again. Thousands of people who owe their lives and health today to the skill and devotion of doctors and nurses are equally indebted to the one and a quarter million men and women who give some of their own life blood so that others may also live. For without the givers, Britain's blood transfusion service, the oldest and one of the best organised in the world, just couldn't exist. <laughs>